It's so good to see all of you here today, especially our visitors. Welcome. This is a beautiful day. It is Ascension Sunday. Actually, this past Thursday was Ascension Day, but we celebrate Ascension Day on Ascension Sunday, the following Sunday. There are many people we want to remember in our prayers this week. Wayne and Avis Boster here. Avis and I had a wonderful song service this past week, and I was so grateful for that. We called up with a friend of ours we hadn't seen in a while. Continue to pray for both of them that they have good days like we had this past Friday. Jimmy Bost is here this morning, continues to improve, having a great life, and we're so glad to see you, Jimmy. Craven Clay continues to do well. Peggy Massey is, of course, doing wonderful. We're so glad she's here with us this morning. Linda Kepley continues to improve, Richard Archer as well. Tammy Miller, continue to pray for her. We hope that relief comes soon for her. Brenda Harkey as well, also having back problems. Katie Kepley Monday continues to improve. Dallas is with us here today. We continue to pray for him. Also, Carolyn Hollig was with us last Sunday. It was great seeing Carolyn and a lot of her family was here with her. That was great, she continues to improve. Josh Blong is just about all healed up now. Our prayers certainly are answered, people. Continue sending them up to heaven. We also want to continue to pray for Karen Lyerly's father, James. He was having a pretty good day when I saw him this past week. Mike and Pete Miller's brother, Tim Miller. We want to remember him in our prayers as well. We also want to uh, remember the family of Cindy Rummage. We had the memorial service for her yesterday. Send prayers up that the Spirit comes and comforts them. Um, after the 11 o'clock service today, we have consistory meeting. This afternoon at 4 o'clock, we have youth group. Tuesday, we will have prayer group at 10. Wednesday, choir practice at 7. Next Sunday is the Sunday Pentecost. The color changes. For the past uh, almost two months now, we've had white for our liturgical color for the season of Easter. Today, with our celebration of Ascension Sunday, the Easter season closes and we begin a new time in the church here next Sunday with the day of Pentecost, which is the birthday of the church, the spirit raining down. On the disciples, the color is red, signifying the fire, the flames in our heart when the spirit comes to us. Everybody, if you can, please wear something red next Sunday in the celebration of the birthday of the church. Now, if you don't have anything red or if you forget and you get up and you think, oh my, I need to wear something red and it's in the dirty clothes box. You can wear orange, green, purple, yellow, any color, white, any color is fine. But if you remember, please do wear red. Also next Sunday at uh, 8.30, remember the bell choir will be practicing. And also, I believe it's 9.45, the Women's Guild will meet in the Fellowship Hall at 9.45 next Sunday. Uh, today is the deadline. If there are any graduates, I only know of two, Cameron and Ashley, but if there are any graduates, there are forms on the front pew. Today's the deadline, so please get one of these and fill it out, and you can just leave it there where uh, they are with the ones that are blank, and I'll be sure to get that to Sharon tomorrow. We need to have that today so she can prepare everything that we need for our graduation. Recognition, which is going to be on the first Sunday in June. So everybody keep that in mind. Again, please do fill out one of these if you need to. Are there any other announcements this morning? If not, we are using our red hymn book today. Our first hymn is 177, Sing With All the Sons. Please stand as we sing our first hymn.
Let us continue with our call to worship, which is found in the bulletin. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. We have seen our Lord on the road. Clap your hands, O ye people. He ascends to reign. We are witnesses to his resurrection and ascension. You may be seated. We will now have our music ministry. Let us now stand and continue with our prayer of confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Let us continue as we say our statement of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried.
he descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Glorious God, you sent us your only Son so that we may experience eternal life. We humbly give these offerings as a faithful response. Let us gather our gifts together and offer them to God in gratitude and praise. As we gather the offering today, we will sing Redeemed, which the words are found in your bulletin. If the ushers will, please come forward. Please rise. Merciful Father, we offer with joy and thanksgiving what you have first given us, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, signs of your gracious love. Receive them for the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Do I see any little young people? I see a whole church full of young people, but are there any little small ones? I don't think we have any this morning. Okay. Let us continue with our congregational prayer. We had some uh, requests earlier. Are there any requests now or any uh, petitions of thanksgiving that anybody would like to give? Yes, indeed. We are so glad you are with us here today, Natalie, and safe travels when you return to Costa Rica. Enjoy North Carolina. Any others? Let us go to the Lord in prayer. 
united in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Ever-present God, root your church firmly in you. Let us neither become entranced, staring up into the heavens, nor distraught by the suffering of the world. Teach us to see you in every face, every place, and every moment. God of the cosmos, your cradle creation in your loving arms and anoint it with the signs of your presence. In the budding of flowers, the birth of a baby, and the formations of the land and sky, reveal your abundant life. Eternal God, you reign, your reign is above us, around us, beneath us, and beside us. As you rule the cosmos with justice and mercy, pour out your spirit upon those in authority that they serve humbly and justly. And with the spirit of peace, we ask you to be with our sisters and brothers in Ukraine and Sudan today. God of compassion, provide clarity and direction for those experiencing life transitions in births and deaths, new employment, new relationships, divorces, departures. We pray for those receiving new diagnosis or undergoing treatment for illness or injury. We also today pray that you would send your healing hand to those that we have named, that you would be with those suffering with COVID, and that you would be with those in our parish who need your hand, Angie, Brent, Cindy, Richard, Avis, Barbara, Delana, Jim, Wayne, Craven, Annie Sue, Sonny, Carolyn, Martha, Calvin, Linda, Shelby, Joyce, Ruby, Chris, and Joni. God of welcome, you call us to the feast at your eternal banquet. We give thanks for those who came before us, whose lives witness to your love. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you will, please, with your red hymn book, stand to page number 176, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Let us sing it this time as we stand.
You may be seated. Our first scripture today comes from the book of Acts. So when they, the disciples, had come together, they asked him, Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all of Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when Jesus had said this, as they were looking on, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Our second scripture today comes from Ephesians. For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and a revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power in us who believe, according to the working of his great might, which he accomplished in Christ when he raised him from the dead and made him sit at his right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion of this world and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is indeed his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Our final scripture today comes from from the book of St. Luke, the 24th chapter. Then Jesus said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgiveness of sin should be preached in his name to all nations. Beginning from Jerusalem, you are witnesses of these things, and behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, you stay in the city until you are clothed with the power of the Spirit from on high. Then he led them out as far as Bethany, and lifting up his hands, he blessed them. While he blessed them, he parted from them and was carried up into heaven. Here ends our scripture for today. If you will, please stand and let us sing the Gloria Patria.
You may be seated. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be wholly acceptable unto you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In our last scripture this morning, which came from the book of Luke, we hear Jesus, as he's talking to the disciples, reminding them that he is the Messiah, the one who had to suffer and die and then rise again from the dead on the third day. It is very appropriate that we end this season of Easter with the 24th chapter of Luke because this scripture that we read this morning that came from Luke is at the end of the 24th chapter. But at the beginning of the 24th chapter is Luke's account of the resurrection of Christ. So we come completely forward from the beginning of that chapter to the place where we are today in our celebration of Christ's resurrection. Jesus reminded his disciples in this passage of something that's very important for us to contemplate today. First, as we celebrate the ascension of Jesus into heaven, but also as we move forward next week to our celebration of Pentecost and the Spirit coming to us, which we call the birthday of the Christian church. It's important for us to remember what it was that Jesus said here because he realized it was important for them to understand this at that time. And of course, the scriptures are given to us to bring the same message to us today, 2,000 years later, that Jesus and all those who were inspired by the Spirit gave to the folks in the time that Jesus was living. What he reminds us of is that this plan of salvation, which culminates in the resurrection of Jesus, although it's not completed yet, this plan of salvation was put into place, Jesus reminds them, all the way back to the beginning. And the beginning of what? Well, the beginning of us messing up. When Adam and Eve fell, they ruined a perfect existence for themselves. Everything was perfect. Love was the dominant power in the Garden of Eden. God's plan had been for us to be created and spend all of eternity. That's forever wrapped up in his arms of love. Our response in the Garden of Eden was that we loved him and we worshiped him. We gave him the praise he deserved. And as we talked about back in Lent when we went through the Ten Commandments, those commandments were what was in our heart in the Garden of Eden. That was how we automatically existed in the Garden of Eden. We messed up. What we did was we disobeyed God. We did not follow the path that he had given us. He made it very clear that we did not need the knowledge that we were going to gain if we ate from that fruit of that tree. I am convinced in my heart that Adam was just as guilty as Eve. He did not have to follow her. So we are all, male and female, all of their children and all that have been since that time and all that will come after us until Jesus returns to this earth, we are all equally guilty. We all made this world a mess. But our loving God, the blessed Holy Trinity, was going to have nothing to do with it. Even after we messed up, and remember that our messing up was in complete disobedience. Those of you who have raised children, which is most of you in this room, know that sickening feeling that you have when you have tried to teach your children the right path and they stumble. And you think, oh my goodness, I tried to help them to avoid this. But we all did that very thing to our parents, gave them that sickening feeling. Well, we gave that same sickening feeling as a multitude of people when Adam and Eve fell. But God's love prevailed and continues to prevail today. God's love is our constant. We can depend on it. And at the very time 
when God confronts Adam and Eve after they have sinned, at that very time, God tells them that he's got a plan to fix things. You will remember that the serpent had, ta had taken on the devil, or had actually taken over the serpent, I guess, and had gone and spoken to Eve and convinced her that she needed to stray from God's path. The essence of what the serpent was representing was our separation from God. And God made it very clear there in the Garden of Eden when God confronted Adam and Eve that he had a plan, that there was going to be one to come, and we now know who the one was, that was God's son, Jesus, who would bruise the head of the serpent, who would put an end to what that serpent stood for, which was sin, which is death, which is our separation from God. Jesus wanted to be sure that day, as he was getting ready to leave earth, that the disciples remembered this, that this plan had been in place from the very beginning. It wasn't like God had one of our human attributes of, well, I don't know of any other way to put it other than pouting. God didn't get angry at us because of the fact that we had sinned and went for a couple of centuries or maybe even a millennium and pouted about it and finally said, well, I guess I still love them. I'll forgive them. Let's go ahead and put this in place. God's love is so overwhelming that immediately when mankind sinned, the plan was put into place to fix it. Jesus is reminding the disciples of this on that day, and he reminded through the Spirit the prophets throughout all of the Old Testament, we see this theme coming back up over and over and over and over. And Jesus again is reminding them that what his purpose was in coming was to fix not the temporal problems of this world. We know that indeed he does help us with these problems in this world, but that wasn't what it was all about. Jesus Christ our Lord came and suffered and died and rose again from the dead for the purpose of solving the forever problem, our separation from God. The disciples had lost sight of this because they had been raised as good Jewish children because the devil had come in and clouded the minds of men to think that the Messiah was going to come and take care of the problems of this world. The children of Israel had been conquered by many nations throughout the centuries, and now they were under Roman rule. A foreign government was over them once again. And when the disciples came to realize that Jesus was the Messiah and the Son of God, they did not comprehend his real purpose, even though he repeatedly told them. And if they couldn't hear him, they had all of these prophecies all the way back to Genesis. And yet, their minds were still clouded. Jesus knew that he needed to bring this up on this day before he left, just once again to let them know that he was the fix to the eternal problem. And today he says the same thing to us. And... We should take a lesson from this clouding of the minds that the devil is able to do in the fact that he had clouded the minds of the children of Israel. So today the devil is working just as hard to cloud our minds. And as we move forward into what this day of ascension is really the very heart of it is about, it is about the glorious rising of our Lord back into heaven. But there's something more important to ascension today than that. And as we focus on that, let us not allow our minds to become clouded so that we don't remember that in fact what ascension is all about is God through his son Jesus Christ on that day gave us a new purpose for our very existence here on this earth. As we go on through the scripture this morning that we read, we see that Jesus tells them this message of salvation should be taken from Jerusalem to all the nations. Let me say this again. To all the nations. To all the nations means to everybody, everywhere. And this is our Lord speaking. And what is that message? There is forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. 
Jesus then reminded them that they had seen these prophecies for, seal, for revealed and seen them fulfilled right before their very eyes. The prophecies of how the problem was going to be set, fixed, how sin was going to be eradicated. They had actually witnessed it then. He wanted them to remember this. And he also wanted them to come to understand that there was something very important for them to do. And again, that from that day forward, it was their very reason for existing. And that is to carry this message of love and salvation to their fellow man. Now, we, and I think probably the disciples that day, oftentimes want things fixed just like that. But that's not the way that God laid out the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation was laid out clearly that Jesus did indeed come and live on this earth. He became one of us and then he suffered for us. He died for us. He took on our sin at Calvary. And then God gloriously rose him from the dead on Easter Sunday morning. Now that fixed the problem but the plan of salvation has not come to completion yet because the way that the plan works is God has put into motion the part of our salvation but there is another part to it and that is that we as mankind if we are given the opportunity must accept that plan of salvation and Jesus is talking to these people on this day when he physically is getting ready to leave earth. He is no longer going to be walking up to human beings and actually speaking to them as he had done for 33 and a half years. He knows this. He's trying to get the, under, the disciples to come to understand that their purpose in life amounts to nothing more than they are to be the mouthpiece of God. They are to speak for God. And that's what he's telling them here before he goes up. He clearly says, take this message to who? Everybody, everywhere. As Jesus continued on, he says, and now I will send the Holy Spirit to you just as my Father promised. Don't begin telling yet this message of salvation and love. Wait for the Spirit to come to empower you. We know that the disciples did leave from that place that day and went back into Jerusalem. We know that the Spirit did come. God never promises anything that he does not keep his promise. We know that that same Spirit that was sent to them on the day of Pentecost is still here with us today in this very room. It was important for the disciples to understand, as it is for us today, that God never asks us to do anything that he does not give us the power to do it. And here he clearly is telling us that one of the reasons that spirit is to come is to give us the power. And when we do what our Lord set out as our goal to do, which is share his love and share his message of salvation, to lead people to Christ, the Spirit comes not once but twice. First, the Spirit comes to us. The Spirit gives us peace. The Spirit gives us courage. The Spirit comes to us to present Jesus to people. I've told you before, sometimes it's as simple as making a smile as you pass someone going into the grocery store. Now, just to show you how simple it is to share God's love, I want every person in this room right now to smile real big. Now, that is how easy we can begin what God has asked us to do in the form of his son, Jesus Christ, as he is ascending into heaven. A smile gets it started. It's that easy. Now, we also see here that what Jesus is doing as the disciples are gathered around him and he's getting ready to go up into heaven is he's giving them a pep rally. And we get a pep rally every week by coming here as well. 
I felt joy in my heart today as we were reciting the Apostles' Creed. First, because we were acknowledging that we do indeed, without any doubt, we are convinced that we, though we worship one God, he makes himself manifest in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And I think of that every week whenever we say our Apostles' Creed. But then today when we got to the part where we said, He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. This is a joy that we don't just have on Ascension Sunday, but we repeat this every Sunday in our creed. Now as we come to the end of our focused verse, and I'm going to add to the end of that a verse from Mark as well that I didn't read this morning. Jesus then led them out along the road to Bethany and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them and he began rising into the sky and went on to heaven. Now, in Luke, he just says that the apostles were blessed. We're going to go to Mark and see what he has to say in the book of St. Mark. Just before Jesus rose up into heaven, he said, You are to go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone, everywhere. This is indeed a blessing. Now, Luke called it a blessing, but Mark expounds on what it was that he was saying. It is a blessing that God allows us to be a part of the salvation of mankind. We should not look at it as a drudgery, but a blessing, because we are allowed to help bring our brothers and sisters into eternity. As I said earlier, we are given the Spirit, we will celebrate that next Sunday, to lead us into the direction that God wishes us to go. We also are given the example of Jesus. Remember, everyone, everywhere. Jesus shunned no one. The fact of the matter is that Jesus as far as we know from the recorded scripture, only guaranteed one person individually that they individually would see him in his kingdom of heaven. That was a man who was getting ready to receive capital punishment. Jesus shunned no one, and we should not either. There are many ways that we can carry God's love and his salvation to people. I was drawn very close to God yesterday at the memorial for Cindy Rummage when I heard the pastor talking about how with Cindy, one of the greatest ways that she shared Jesus' love and his salvation was not with her mouth, but with her hands. The congregation that she attended once a month has a meal where they invite people that are homeless. Pastor mentioned some of the people that came just were walking out of jail. And he said, Cindy shared the gospel of Jesus through her hands, fixing food for people who were hungry via their stomachs and who were hungry through their souls. I saw a bumper sticker this past week and I chuckled when I first looked at it. And then I thought, you know, this person may not know it, but they're driving around preaching a sermon. The bumper sticker said, do you follow Jesus this closely? <laughs> now think about it. There's a sermon right there on that bumper sticker. Do we follow Jesus closely? Do we follow Jesus' example of taking his message of love and salvation to everybody, everywhere? I challenge you this week as we are celebrating today the ascension of our Lord into heaven and his new purpose that he gave us as we go in. Follow that purpose. Follow Jesus' example and take his message of love and salvation to everybody, everywhere. Amen. If you will, please stand with your red hymnals and turn to page number 182. Let's sing, Fairest Lord Jesus. Fairest Lord Jesus.